Welcome, RC family, to our small groups ministries. I know that during our last time together, we spoke about a very important subject matter, and that is how the church is to relate to widows and to our parents who are getting older. And I know that that uh, lesson touched a lot of uh, sensitivity within our own hearts as some of us are dealing with that issue right now or have dealt with it. And for some of us, it's preparing us for when that time comes. Uh, this portion of the text is part two. It's verses 17 through six through two of First Timothy chapter five. And uh, this is going to talk about two other important relationships. That is the relationship of an elder and the relationship of a bond servant. So this was an important uh, instruction for the church. The community of believers were to strive for genuine fellowship while serving the Lord, or, Lord and each other. Elders were charged with overseeing the spiritual life of the community that included sound doctrine, growing relationships, and an effort on the part of the elder to make sure that the life of believers were conducive of being a Christian. The time required to fulfill such a calling demanded procedures to help support their efforts and also to place accountability around them in case of their own failure. Paul shares significant insight to safeguard against assigning an elder before he is proven. Another important relationship within the community was between masters and slaves. Household slaves were considered part of the family, and their conduct towards the master was a reflection of the household itself. This advice was important because of a movement that the Romans thought might incite slave discontentment would immediately be labeled as subversive and subjected to persecution. Paul wanted both Christians who were slaves and those who were free to engage in mutually respectful relationships indicative of embracing the gospel and of being a witness to the world. So with all that being said, let's now look at verses 17 and 18. Let the elder who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Now we want to look at the first part of that uh, verse 17, and that is who rules well. The role of an elder involves spiritual authority related to the proclamation and teaching of the gospel and encouraging people to embrace the word of God through practical application. And so we can't eliminate those things from ruling well. An honest proclamation of the gospel with an honest love for the congregation that he's proclaiming the good news to with a hope of discipling those underneath his care. That would be indicative of an elder ruling well. Also, his continued growth in the Lord. The elder's authority corresponds to his submission to Christ and his love for the people under his care. Spiritual authority finds its greatest influence through continued submission and humility to the Lord and to each other. An elder who has been truly appointed by God will be loved and respected by the majority of those under his care. So it goes on to say, worthy of double honor. What does that mean, double honor? Well, that is in reference to a compensation given to them. It has Old Testament uh, connotations connected to it. For instance, in Numbers 18 and 21, talking about honor and talking about providing for the elder, the Bible says the following, to the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service, which they perform the service of the tent of meetings. So in other words, the Old Testament is, is providing a platform from which those who are laboring should get some kind of compensation for their labor. Deuteronomy 26, 12 through 13 also has a reference point to this understanding of double honor. Now, I do realize and understand that honor and shame was very prevalent in the New Testament during the first century. 
In other words, the first century uh, Jewish person would run heavily after being honored by people. Matter of fact, they almost treated honor as some kind of co commodity that you could, you know, purchase and buy. It was important for their family line to be respected and to have honor granted to them. Jesus wanted people to understand this kind of honor, but he, he takes it a step further. In Jesus' understanding of honor, it was not a commodity but it was actually connected to a person's humility because that is indicative of a person's now audience shifting from what other people think about him to what God thinks about him. And so that's an important distinction that we need to be made here. But in this reference, I do believe the double honor is more about uh, coming alongside of the elder with some kind of compensation. So with that being said, let's look at now um, 1 Timothy 5, verse 18. For Scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it, it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. This is indicative of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 25, 4. You shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. What does this mean for us today? Well, while working, the ox, of course, was allowed to eat the grain as he was grinding. And that's the point of it. The laborer deserves his wages. In other words, while the laborer, the elder, is going out and proclaiming the gospel, loving the sheep that's under his care, there should be some kind of compensation as he does this work for the Lord. Now, God's provision for his leadership will require trust and faith, not only from the leader, but also from the community of believers as well. While the Lord moves upon the hearts of people to give, the worker must always remember, as well as the giver, that the worker is employed by the Lord himself. The New Testament encouraged both monetary support and local congregations of local congregations, and also in the event that the local congregation cannot provide the way that it needs to, then the elder must consider being a tent maker. That is simply going outside of the church and working to help supplement his income. Elders must not focus on a lavish lifestyle or manipulate people into giving through deceptive, unbiblical teachings. I remember during my uh, time in my undergraduate work, during the last couple of months uh, before graduation and just standing out in the foyer after chapel service. Some of you have heard this story before, but it's, it's worth repeating here just to show you that sometimes elders are motivated by other things other than being a servant of Christ. I remember overhearing some of my colleagues talking about the positions that they were going to take, and most of their... Uh, most of their dialogue was centered upon, you know, what the compensation was going to be like. Did it have medical benefits? What was the size of the congregation? And that just resonated within my heart as being wrong. <laughs> it's not about what you can get out of a church. It's not about the salary that they're going to provide for you. It's not about the medical benefits. It's about a calling. And it's about trusting God to provide supernaturally when there doesn't seem to be a way. That's very important uh, as we consider this uh, particular text. Now, I should say this, that there should be some considerations for determining salaries for elders. Compensation is important. The Bible says that we should compensate those who are working the fields. And some of those determining factors, I believe, should follow these guidelines. What is the size of the gathering? If the gathering only has 10 people in it, then that compensation should be lower than a congregation that has a couple hundred people in it. What's the location of the gathering? Certainly, people from the Northeast understands that it costs a lot of money to live here. We're taxed and overtaxed, and housing is just incredibly expensive. Those on the West Coast would experience the same things, but go to the Midwest, and there'd be a little bit of a difference in what you're going to pay for housing and some of the uh, commodities that are necessary for living. So location's another consideration. Demographics of the givers. 
You know, some churches, for instance, churches in the northeast of New Jersey have a lot of people who are professionals that go into the city, uh, a lot of teachers, uh, laborers, architects, doctors in this area. Now, if you take, for instance, Syracuse, New York, it may be a little bit different than the northeast of New Jersey. Uh, it may not have the demographics of people involved to support uh, the work. And then the last consideration, and I'm sure there's others, should be the, the need of the elder. Elders' needs should be met, not their wants, and also should be a consideration of their age. Now, I can tell you firsthand that uh, I've been here over 30 years now, and I would say about 12 years or 13 years of that uh, being here, uh, I was a tent maker. I was compensated from the church, and then I went out to work. I know the young men that we have now within our congregation are tent makers, compensated, and also they're going out to work on a daily basis. I, I think we're, we're probably in a period of time where that's going to be more of the norm, this idea of a, the professional that gets full-time benefits and salaries. Uh, those days may be coming to an end soon. And so even an older elder has to consider what he can do to cut the costs, or even if God is asking him to work outside in the secular world, that should be a consideration. So with that being said, we now move to verses 19 through 21. We're going to shift gears from uh, the laborer getting uh, a wage to an accusation against an elder. This is a very serious matter. Uh, very serious in a sense that this could really affect the entire congregation. What, how this is dealt with, what kind of accusation is presented. And so that's why it's very important that we go through this now so that we understand before you make an accusation against an elder, let's make sure that we're biblical in what we're doing. It says, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Verse 21, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudicing, doing nothing from partiality. So an accusation against an elder must be confirmed it must be confirmed through at least two credible witnesses. So it's not just a hearsay thing. It's not, I think. It's not, I was in prayer last night and I had a dream about the elder and this is what happened. It's none of that. It's credible witnesses. And this comes directly from the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 15 through 17, the Bible says this, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. It goes on to say, only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties uh, to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in the office in those days. When the accusation has been verified, it has to be verified. And it is a persistent sin. Now notice that. Go back to 1 Timothy 5. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three as for those who persist in sin. So this is a sin that's an ongoing sin now that is getting in the way of his intimacy with the Lord and his ability to lead in righteousness and in holiness. That is the criteria. And it goes on to say that then there must be discipline administer because such sin breaks the trust that the church has placed in him and God has placed in him. Such public rebuke moves beyond the discipline procedures that apply to members of the congregation. Matthew 18 talks about the discipline that must come about when members are struggling in their ability to fulfill the Lord's commandments. 
it says the following in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and tell his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two along with you that every charge, notice the language, that every charge here may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. If he refuses to even listen to the church, let him uh, be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now that is in reference to a normal person in the congregation, but the two or three witness principles is there. And, and also, <clears throat> the hope of this is to restore the individual. Judaism strongly emphasized reproof and correction publicly as the final resort only if private attempts have failed. <clears throat> so let's work through this for just a moment. If an accusation is brought before, uh, is, if an accusation is brought against an elder, then the polarity of elders must meet together with the accusation and with that elder, and they must determine whether or not there's, there's credibility to the story. If there is credibility to the story, then the polarity of elders will meet with that elder and talk to them uh, about the situation at hand in hopes that they can work through a, a, a restoration period of time where the elder will finally be restored. That's the, the goal of it. Now, this public rebuke is necessary. Why is it necessary? For the purpose of showing God's holiness and that God is, is very concerned about those who are administering the word and have been entrusted uh, to lead the church. <clears throat> the purpose of the public rebuke is to show the congregation that sin cannot be covered up within the eldership while invoking, of course, the fear of the Lord to be administered. Deuteronomy 19, verse 19 through 20 says the following. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Now, verse 21 of our text in chapter 5 says, In the presence of God and of Christ and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without being prejudiced, doing nothing from partiality. It's, it's interesting language that the Bible is using here. The charge is considered in the heavenly courtroom of God himself. Why are angels brought into the courtroom? Well, Paul's inclusion of angels is proper consideration in their involvement with the final judgment. When God pours out his final judgment, the angels of the Lord will be there administering judgment. So the ultimate wis, uh, witness for such a charge is the heavenly angels who can judge with fairness and with righteousness. And this also speaks about the seriousness of this charge and allegation against an elder. Uh, and again, the, the consideration is the heavenly courtroom of God. And it uh, connection with that would be Matthew twenty five thirty one, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious thrones and then he will judge the nations. The angels are part of that righteous judgment, which should bring to our attention the need to be careful when appointing eldership within the church. Elders must have some kind of theological foundation of fundamental doctrines, an ongoing desire to study, a willingness to come together, a desire to love those who seem unlovable at times. In 1 Timothy 5, 22-25, the Bible says this, Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and for your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. The Bible begins here to say, do not be hasty. That word means don't lay hands without pain, 
too quick, too soon. Go through the agonizing process of talking with the individual, of watching the individual, of giving them an opportunity to teach and, and see how they teach and see whether or not the foundations of scriptures is something they can pull from. Otherwise, it will become negligence on the part of those who are laying hands on the elders. Do not appoint unqualified men for elders out of negligence. Never do it. Negligence is the failure to take proper instruction seriously. There are many poor reasons why people are appointed elders in the church today. Let me just list a couple of them. Popularity. Some churches appoint elders because the person is popular or is likable. The second is gifting. A number of churches that I know of have no criteria in place for the character of person. It's only what they can bring to the plate with their giftings. The second is they have resources. Some are appointed because they're great givers, because they can underwrite some of the ministries within the church, and it's a manipulative tool that is used. And some elders are actually appointed by Satan himself. We know that Satan walks around as a roaring lion, and we know he dresses himself up in sheep clothing at times. So the charge here is to be very careful of who becomes an elder within the church. The laying on of hands is the signification of an ordination for service. Ordination for service should only take place after a person has been tested. Just like Timothy was tested. In 1 Timothy 4 14 through 16, the scripture says, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourselves and on your teaching, persist in them, for by doing so, you will save yourself and your hearers. So let me very quickly recap here the appointment of eldership. Be careful who's appointed. They must be tested. Not only biblically, but hear me, relationally. A shepherd has to not only rightly divide the word, but he has to be able to be patient with people, compassionate towards people, long-suffering, waiting for people to get it, not being a a, a tight-fisted man that Bible thumps people, but comes alongside of people with gentleness, not compromising, not losing discernment, right? But really coming alongside the sheep, knowing that the sheep don't belong to him. He is just an under shepherd of the great shepherd. Must be confirmed by others. There has to be a recognition that this man is indeed an elder. And they must, of course, walk in obedience to the Lord. Now, verse 23 says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Timothy was abstaining from the Lord's Supper, probably because of the criticism from false teachers. Some ascetics abstain from wine. Paul tells him, use it again. Now, we have to understand the content of alcohol was significantly lower than it is now, today, the alcohol that we drink. Most people drank wine with their dinner, two parts of water to one part of fermented wine. Certainly, the early communion supper would use the mixture of water and wine. Wine was used for frequent stomach issues as well, preventing dysentery and also to disinfect the water from contamination. So this is why Paul is telling Timothy to use wine. He's not suggesting that you get drunk in wine, and he's not suggesting, I don't believe that the wine of the day was, didn't have any alcohol contact. Anybody that does any kind of historical background checks on this, uh, it, it, there's complete evidence that there was, there was an alcohol content to it. Now, verse 24 goes on to say, the sins of some are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. 
further things to consider here. Some sins don't appear right away. They've been concealed. Some good works that we do are not showing up now, but they eventually will. Improper discernment in appointment of elders causes great harm to all. What is needed is a discernment. And what I've learned over the years is that discernment and intimacy with the Lord go hand in hand. When we lose our discernment, more times than not, it's because our intimacy with the Lord has been hampered. And uh, also uh, in, in verse 24, I think we could say that character of a person's life can only be evaluated over a period of time and testing. Now, he's going to quickly shift to the relationship between bondservant and masters, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6. Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So in keeping with expectations dealing with the household, Paul now includes relationship between slaves and masters. Bond servants are are those who are under either believing masters or unbelieving masters, but they must have a good attitude in their work ethic and in their relationship with their masters. The witness to the world around them will be seen through their relationship within the household and their ability to work with those that may not be treating them well or may be treating them very well. Likewise, masters must treat their bond servants with dignity and with respect. This relationship shows up numerous times within the scriptures. In Colossians 3, 22 through 25, bond servants obey in everything, uh, obey, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleases, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. And and that's the key of it all. The key of it all is that whatever you do, Whatever relationship you have, always keep the Lord before yourself. The motive of the bondservant honoring their masters is his service for the Lord. And for the unbeliever to see authentic faith lived out, the witness of Christ seen through the actions of believers gives credence to the gospel message. Relationships that reflect love, respect, honor, and forgiveness become distinctively different from many relationships outside of Christ. The ultimate purpose of godly relationships is to glorify God while edifying fellow believers and being a genuine testimony to the world around us. So I'm going to ask now that our small group leaders will lead us through a number of discussion questions as we ponder and think about some relative applications to the scriptures that we have just gone through. May God richly bless you and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen.